Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about what I'm going to cover. I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I wrote this book. I wasn't planning to write it. It was kind of an accidental project. Um, I'll briefly review some of the data and methods and then explain what I mean by commercialization and the, the use of coded symbols. Um, I had been studying German nationalism and vocational schools and trying to understand how teachers were addressing right-wing extremism. These were the kinds of images I was familiar with in the schools where I worked, construction trades, uh, in particular had relatively high risk um, youth and a, and a large number of youth who were far right. And there was at that time in the 80s and 90s, in the early part of the 2000s in Germany and Europe, kind of a racist skinhead look of a shaved head and a bomber jacket and high black combat boots that was essentially a uniform and that many people still associate with the far right today. Uh, and when I went back to, I went to Berlin in 2009 for a conference and my editor for this first book said, um, and while you're there, could you look for a cover photo? Because we don't have a good idea of what we want to do. And so I went to an archive I had been working with for years called the Anti-Fascist Archive, uh, an educational center, and they put me in touch with three photographers who track the far right in all public settings nationally. So protest marches and commemorations and concerts and festivals. And those three photographers gave me unrestricted access to 10 years of archived photos um, to look for a cover photo, which of course they were going to be paid for, so you know it made sense. And as I started to look through those photos, I started seeing you know different kind of images, even from when I had been there just three, four years before. I particularly was seeing one brand called Torsteiner, which I'll talk about in a minute, but more mainstream colors, certainly mainstream styles, new kinds of symbols, uh, high quality clothing um, showing up on the market in ways I had never seen. And I had been, at that point, spent 15 years on and off living in Germany. Um, I quickly discovered there were other brands, websites uh, selling clothing in brighter colors, often coded in kind of um, relatively uh, hard to interpret ways, but clear nevertheless. So this t-shirt, Rai Conquista, refers to, uh, it says Spirit of 1492, which is the name of a pogrom in Spain in the 15th century against Muslims. Um, some codes were not coded at all. Um, you know, very clear text, um, very clear, uh, but also kind of a play on word on the back of a lavender shirt, on the front of a lavender shirt. Some of the brands were a little bit more alternative in their styles. Um, you know, you different kinds of piercings and tattoos, but others were preppier. They sometimes referenced very contemporary topics. So this one says, send them back. Um, and on the back it says, Fortress Europe, Europe, illegals go home, right? So uh, embedding contemporary language. And you'll notice this is 30 euros. So 30 euros, about $35 for a t-shirt. I mean, these are not cheap items of clothing. They're quite expensive. They're very well made. They are um, along the lines of a kind of Abercrombie and Fitch or J. Crew, if you have American reference points. Uh, and so I came home from that trip, it was just a one week archive, you know, conference trip and an archive visit, and I was floored. I mean, I just, it was hands down the most affirming experience I've had as an academic because it just gripped me. I, I thought I'd write an article about it, but um, it wouldn't let me go. I would wake up in the night kind of trying to figure out what was happening, why were they, how were they developing this, who was producing it, did youth know what they were wearing, did they know what they were buying? Uh, so initially I uh, developed I decided to analyze the images. So I built, I took a sabbatical year, built uh, 3,000, in the end, or about 3,000 images in a database, uh, drawing heavily on those photographers, but also on hundreds of screenshots, um, digitized all the product catalogs going backwards to uh, when the brands began in 2002, visited archives in the US and Germany to trace some of the symbol usage backwards, um, coded all of that, and then discovered I still wasn't quite satisfied. You can imagine why this might have been a little frustrating for my family, who I kept dragging to Germany five times. My young kids eventually put them in school for a year there um, while I had a fellowship. Um, and uh, they ended up bilingual. I think it worked out for them, but uh, hopefully they'll appreciate it someday. Um, but ended up going back and doing um, 62 interviews in two vocational schools for construction trades, 51 of those interviews with young people and 11 with their teachers that are more illustrative. I chose those two schools. Um, they're the only two schools for construction trades in Berlin. Um, and so all youth in the construction trades end up in them. Construction is a high-risk field for the far right in Europe. 
Um, and luckily, one of those schools bans all of this clothing. The young people have to sign a form that has an attachment and an appendix of logos and brands. They're not allowed to wear any of them. It's a very strict dress code. The other one doesn't ban anything on the principle of sort of democratic, democratic expression. So the idea was it would be a quasi kind of experimental design. I oversampled occupations that I knew had far right engagement, so scaffold builders in particular, for lots of reasons I can discuss, uh, have higher far right engagement. So we oversampled the scaffold builders and the concrete layers. Um, and ultimately interviewed 51 young people aged 16 to 39. Um, their average age was 21, although I will say there were two older interviewees who returned to school after a long time, like a second career, who kind of skewed it upward. So mostly they were 17, 18, uh, some 19 year olds. And anyway, it was all coded in a software program, which I can talk about. I'm not gonna go into this very much, but I do wanna say uh, you know, that most work on extremism, particularly on the far right, has studied formal organized political parties and voter behavior. Uh, and what I am trying to show with this book is that the far right and other forms of extremism, I would argue well, are not only political, but also cultural and ultimately emotional spaces. And that those cultural and emotional spaces um, are in some cases the predominant driving force why young people end up moving into extremist movements and that ideology comes later. So I'm gonna explain a little bit about how the commercialization happens, what I mean by this, uh, and then we'll talk more about the Islamophobic images. Of course, uh, there was uh, early commercialization in Germany. This didn't come out of uh, just nowhere, but it was predominantly um, under the Nazi era, kind of touristic souvenir items uh, called kitsch or tacky kind of um, uh, souvenir type products. Later in the 80s, you did start to see some commercialization of products and some codes, which I can talk about, like the number 88, which stands for the eighth letter of the alphabet, which is for HH for Heil Hitler. I mean, you would see these kinds of, and then things like um, the eight ball with the number 18, which was for Adolf Hitler. So, and you know, that, anyway, lots of kinds of, of codes embedded, but there were very cheap products, stickers and bumper stickers and buttons and, t-shirts that were not expensive that tended to fall apart quickly. I mean, it was a really very, it mostly sold through distributors um, and through mail order catalogs. You know, nothing like what came next when this brand, Torsteiner, burst onto the scene with um, a logo, which you can see up in the top in that circle, that took two band symbols used by the Nazi party, combined it into a new logo, a new symbol, every state basically sued them for um, uh, not being able to, you know, saying you couldn't use this because these are banned symbols. They won all of the court cases on a semiotic argument, which was that the combination of two banned symbols creates a new symbol, which no longer directly references the banned organization. Probably the one time that cultural sociologists came really important in legal uh, distinctions, but you know, you, they play very much uh, with this legal line of what's allowed and not allowed. They created, they opened uh, mainstream stores. They're all over Europe. They're in uh, Finland and Croatia, in uh, a dozen in Russia alone, and in Moscow alone, rather, um, that have, you know, bamboo flooring and steel and glass entryways and fake boxwoods at the register. They look very mainstream. They have a variety of catalogs that, uh, again, show some of this alternative anger towards society and resistance, but also other kinds of um, coding, like, for example, this <coughs> T-shirt, which Americans often know, the code Wustenfuchs, which means desert fox, which was the nickname of Erwin Rommel, who commanded the troops, the Nazi troops uh, in North Africa. Um, and so this kind of coding that can mean one thing, can mean another. Young people would say in the interviews, like, it lives in the gray zone, you know, not everybody understands it, but insiders will know what it means. Um, here, this is hard to see a little bit, but it says uh, swastika across the back, which is a Danish word um, for, for, for swastika in English. The German word is hakenkreuz. That word hakenkreuz would be illegal if it was on the back of that sweatshirt, but they put it in the Danish word, or the Danish, and it's legal, which was a 2011 court ruling forced to rule on this issue that now says that uh, uh, banned symbols become legal if they're put in a language other than German. What's interesting about this, aside from the way they're playing with that, is they market it uh, on the legality. So on the right here, you see it's a 76 euro um, jacket. It's again, not inexpensive. 
Um, and here, where it tells you all about the quality of the cotton and how good the zipper is, the very first line says, you know, reklich absolut unbedenklich, which means perfectly legal. So they're marketing the legality of the symbol and the code as part of its appeal. And you'll see this most recent image uh, from June 2016, which is also in the galley of the book. Um, this guy in the middle, his t-shirt says, I mean, there's so many contradictions here. It's, in the, it's imitating the logo of, of an American rap group called Run DMC, which has its own sets of contradictions. But it says HKNKRZ, which is the, uh, evokes the German word for Hakenkreuz, for swastika, but with the vowels removed. So this guy wore this in Dortmund, in a city, in a protest march, and then a whole legal debate ensued. Is a word a word if the vowels get removed? And uh, eventually, the legal determination was it is not a word, um, and so it's not illegal. So you get this kind of rapid coding and game playing and transformation. Um, just one other example, when I, this is before I actually began this project, I had heard the number 88 because of its uh, substitution for the word for Heil Hitler, was banned from display in a school in the state of Brandenburg. And young people started wearing t-shirts that said, you know, 87 plus one, right? So, <laughs> so it just creates this kind of game playing um, coding culture. So I'm gonna quickly take you through what I think is the most intricate and subtle form of coding, which also plays into um, other forms of extremism and also into the kind of Make America Great Again um, slogan, um, which is the myths of sacred origin. It's the most ubiquitous set of symbols and uh, iconography in the imagery, uh, which have to do with the Nordic and the Viking times. Um, there's a lot of theory in the chapter, which I won't go into now, but these are myths that basically almost every society has that links a whole set of different issues that link sacred territory with reverence for the glorious dead and kind of um, ethnic or blood-based origins and a golden age. So this kind of fantastical myth around a time that we had at one point as our people and often uses magical thinking, particularly in the German case. So in Germany, there is a sacred origin narrative for the far right, which says that the German, German, modern day Germans are descended from the Germanic tribes who were originally Nordic um, with Aryan roots, all right? There's a long history of this I go into in the book, but basically it has held very long, powerful sway for far-right extremists in Germany since well before World War II. Um, this set of runic symbols here, if you see this one right here, the Sigrun, um, that is the, the major symbol for the uh, Schutzstaffel, for the SS, right? And, and other runic symbols also uh, several of these are the ones that were combined by Torsteiner into that logo um, and they were used in other divisions uh, under the Nazis. Um, this a still slide from a Hitler Youth propaganda film, for example, said, you know, where does our holy land lie in North Germany? The original homeland of the Germanic tribes is our holy land. The Germanic tribes were the oldest sailors. They built the first ships. Vikings discovered Iceland, Greenland, and America. And you would see, you know, in the archives, I'd find images like this of young people in Nazi Germany building Viking ship models, right? So very clearly being taught in this way that this is their heritage. Um, today in the catalogs, it shows up in two ways. One, you'll see things like snowy ski slopes and Nordic Scandinavian architecture and boat yards and glaciers and compasses and shipyards. But you also see things like, you know, a brand, Eric and Sons, for Viking girls, like direct text and imagery and iconography and Nordic spellings and product names that are um, Scandinavian rather than German, for example, although this is a German brand. Tosh Diner, the largest brand that launched in 2002, that kind of started the whole thing off. <coughs> Thankfully, uh, this line of children's clothing is now defunct, but uh, when they did have a children's line, one of the products, for example, was this sweatshirt um, that had the runic alphabet on it, and underneath it it says, Tosh Tainer, know your ABCs, right? So telling them, again, these are your ABCs, this is your heritage. Again, for 28 euros. Um, again, just all kinds of images of Vikings, of Viking Nordic references um, throughout the clothing. Legends, um, this one I won't go into, but, you know, legends that use Nordic gods, that are kind of selling um, the Nordic mythology. And 
linking it to traits that are seen as desirable. So I won't, um, uh, the iconography gets a little bit messed up here, but it says, this is the catalog cover for one of the brands, and it says, in this time without honor in which old values don't hold true anymore, Ansga Arian, that's the brand, uh, stands for loyal friends, old heroes, Germanic gods, and true ideals. So you see these kinds of, um, these kinds of uh, traits that one should aspire to as a nationalist, right? So I spent a lot of time, years in fact, trying to figure out why the Nordic myths and fantasies were so powerful. Um, and I discovered a lot of different things in part through interviews. One is that they allow an evocation of, they allow young people or consumers to evoke whiteness or Aryanness without using any tabu or legal symbols. It's just a kind of a hint. And young people just told me this very straightforwardly. So Kevin says, Vikings are out. Why are these Vikings so powerful? You know, I think it was the question, like, why are there so many Nordic symbols? He says, well, Vikings are often a symbol for Nordic, which is associated with Aryan. Mahmud, who's uh, of Turkish background in one of the schools, says, well, it's simple. The further you come toward the north, the whiter the people are. So, you know, the, the, the Nordic reference is a way of talking about whiteness without talking about whiteness. But they do other things, too. They, they evoke the sense of being poised to uh, restore a golden era in which Germanic tribes were somehow the apex of civilizations. They valorize violence and weapons associated with violence and honorable deaths. And so the, the clothing is filled with axes and guillotines and swords and spears and spears and all kinds of things, particularly weapons associated with that time period. Georg, very informative uh, about the clothing, owns a lot of it. and talked a lot, said, for example, Nordic gods were always the most powerful. They were honored. So this, oh, you're looking for a fight, is a proclamation. If someone wants a fight with us, he can have it, but he'll lose. And that's why these Nordic gods are applied. If they put an Aphrodite on it, then everybody would say, what kind of crap is that? Right? So this kind of sense of the violence is part of the story. Also, as you saw from that catalog cover, they identify traits to which one should aspire, right? Heroism and loyalty and devotion and purity. They clearly establish who belongs and who doesn't. And they enable an anticipation of some world that, where things are going to get better, where, as, as you will, America would be great again, right? In that same kind of restoration narrative, a sense of promise that there's something better coming. So, just before I move into the uh, images of Islamophobia in particular, I want to talk a little bit about what I learned about what these brands do, because they're here now in the States too, the same brands, but also new ones in the U.S. Um, so one of the things I learned is that the brands uh, grant access for young people to the scene. So Martin, who self-identified as a right-wing nationalist, that was his phrase, said, when I go out, the clothes are actually really important, because you won't get into a lot of events at all, unless you're dressed like a right-wing person. So they offer access to kind of concerts and scenes where you have to show some kind of legitimacy if you're not known to the crowd. They also help young people find others who think like them, they say. So the clothing provides a group togetherness feeling, symbolism. We are one, we wear the same thing. We symbolize Torsteiner, this brand. Torsteiner symbolizes right-wing ideas. This is, well, Torsteiner was just an example. Could also have been Lonsdale or something, which Poor Lonsdale, I'll talk about later, that's a British brand that got co-opted by the scene. It's not on purpose, um, which I can talk about later why that happened, but became uh, coincidentally adopted. And then finally, Lucas, who was a really interesting case because his father was even more extreme than he was, and so was drawn into the scene through his father, who got him the first clothing, says, you go into a bar or someplace to party, you see someone with Torsteiner clothing on, and so you think, okay, maybe I'm not so alone after all, or I'm not the only one who can't exactly identify with mainstream society. So they offer, the clothing offers a sense of purpose or meaning or an entry into a world in which there is a sense of purpose or meaning or some other kind of belonging. So, you know, every project has its skeptics. When you have to go through peer review, you hear a lot of skepticism. And my reviewers over the years for uh, funding, but also as I wrote the book, seem to fixate on one point, really. Um, how could clothing radicalize youth? Like, this is all fine and good, but aren't you being a little alarmist? Um, one reviewer just wrote, won't they grow out of it? You know, won't they just grow out of it? Isn't this just, 
I mean, actually, I think Americans now would react a little bit differently than they did, you know, six years ago, seven years ago. But I learned that I had to really much more clearly articulate why I think style is a gateway to extremism. Um, and so I won't go through all of this here, but, you know, there's a lot that happens through the clothing and what, what the clothing gives them access to, uh, both in terms of creating legitimacy and access to the scene, but also um, socializing them and coaching them into a certain way of being and, uh, and dehumanizing um, victims acting as a conduit of resistance and kind of um, uh, softening kind of racist expression uh, by evoking whiteness without mentioning race. So in some, what I argue in the book is that the clothing itself isn't just a reflection of identity, but can also strengthen it um, and can mobilize extremist action. That tends to be the hardest point for reviewers to buy into, but I have spent more time in the book, I think, after the first round of reviews to articulate that, and so hopefully it's become clearer. And I think, given what's happening in the US, it has become clearer here. Um, so I, I wanted to go through a little bit to focus on some of the clothing that, and particularly how I see uh, Islamophobic references coming out in the clothing. There are a lot of examples of Islamophobic references and, and anti-immigrant sentiment in general, which gets kind of interlaced with some of the anti-Islam messaging. It's common across the clothing. It's sometimes very subtle and historically grounded, like in that Reconquista uh, code, but in other times it's very, very clear. Um, it often subverts or plays with images from the left, so trying to take the language of multiculturalism and turn it around, uh, and I'll give you some examples. It's also showing up here now in the US brands, particularly targeting veterans, and so there's this intersection of um, gun culture, a valorization of violence, pro-veteran uh, language on the clothing in the US and then anti-immigrant or anti-Islam sentiment. So this is a good example. Um, after the refugee influx into Germany in 2015, um, this, be, this was a popular t-shirt uh, that circulated a, a bumper sticker, uh, something people would put in the windows and quickly a brand uh, associated with the Identitarian, the Identitarian movement produced this uh, almost mirror image um, of the iconography. Um, this one also is new, this came out just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, took me a while to figure it out, but it says celebrate diversity, and then in the text up here it says celebrate the real diversity. And what you have here, it's hard to see, but First of all, the colors are a little bit evocative of Obama and Obama's campaign and some of the iconography um, from that, uh, from, from his election campaigns. But there are nine uh, images of different headgear. So I had to Google a lot of headgear to figure out exactly what these were. I recognize some of them, but others I still haven't identified. But you have um, a Christian, couple of Christian Crusader helmets. There's a World War I helmet. There's a World War II gas mask there. Uh, there is um, a two martial arts, type of martial arts helmets, which are really popular right now with the far right, um, kind of fighting gems, martial arts. Uh, and so, you know, here it's a play on the left, not in an immediately only Islamophobic way, but also anti-Semitic. Um, but the Christian Crusader helmets and then the, the martial arts headgear, the kind of linking of contemporary imagery with um, older imagery. This one takes the coexist logo that you probably know from the US and says you can't coexist with people who want to kill you. And as iconography of spattered blood, mostly across the crescent uh, on the left. And um, this t-shirt uh, produced by this company that sells clothing targeting veterans, um, I spotted on a couple of months, about a month ago, when these two women in Arizona were arrested for uh, desecrating a mosque, um, and then the Southern Poverty Law Center posted a picture of them in front of the mosque that from a still, they live streamed it to Facebook, and one of them was wearing this shirt, oh, the women's version of the shirt. So, you know, it's, they are clearly out there and circulating um, in the world. This brand, which is associated with the identitarian movement, uh, says, uh, batten down the, uh, throw up the borders, batten down the hatches, right? Throw down the anchor, batten down the hatches. 
that what's important about that is it actually doesn't indicate much at all. But when you read the text next to it, it says, uh, sorry, the German quotation marks showed up here instead of the, um, the English kind. But, uh, you know, it says, this T-shirt is under the banner of the asylum mania. Whoever stands against the grain of the refugees welcome mania like us and doesn't want to see how Europe falls further uh, toward the abyss. With this t-shirt model, you visually throw down the anchor, the craziness has to be stopped, borders up, and batten down the hatches. So, you know, you'll see a, a t-shirt that doesn't necessarily mean much when paired with that marketing text takes on a very clear message for consumers who are buying that shirt, but wouldn't necessarily be read in that particular way. This is the latest US brand. Um, there's nothing in this text uh, on their website um, that says anything particularly Islamophobic or anti-immigrant, but in their text that describes who they are, um, they have a whole lot of stuff around, uh, they're creating a counterculture to the Marxist and degenerate ideals that are constantly being forced upon us. Um, what I want to point to is this at the bottom, when they talk about, I don't know if you can see it, this our guys, this helps, so their, their products are, um, it's helping keep our guys employed. That use of the double um, backslash with the word without a space is an alt-right um, signal. Uh, it means, so they use it with our values, they use it with our guys, and it means um, the far right. So it helps keep far right men or youth employed um, and sus able to sustain their struggle against the EU and other subversive forces. So again, it's, you know, they're posting images from um, from protest marches in the States on their website. There's a lot of social media um, around it. Uh, and again, not directly, right now the clothing isn't directly um, Islamophobic or anti-immigrant, but I just took this one today. Uh, it's the, it got cut off at the top, but it says thought criminal, uh, right brand apparel, and the text at the bottom sort of says, you know, this t-shirt fits anyone who's dared to think outside the left-wing narrative. So it has this kind of clear messaging around um, you know, what's happening and we're being policed, our thoughts are being policed. Um, uh, and there's even a typo on their own website. Um, instead of right-wing thinkers, it says ring-wing thinkers. But, um, and just, you know, to show you that there's a, a variety of, um, of, uh, of options here. It's not just clothing, but there's stickers even for four euros. You can buy a sticker that, in Germany, that uh, says, you know, send illegals and Islamists back home. Um, so there is, you know, it does show up as a theme throughout the clothing. I'm, I'm not going to go in great length uh, into what I usually uh, end with here, but I just want to say when I, when I speak to our audiences of sociologists who tend to sometimes be skeptical about the power of economic objects um, and material culture to shape identity, uh, rather than merely be a reflection of it, I spend more time on this part. Um, but my, my main point is um, that I think it's important to understand that style is not only something that reflects how young people are feeling, but also has the power to shape it. And uh, we know that about music, and we have paid much more attention to far-right music. After Charlottesville last year, uh, a whole lot of music platforms kicked far-right music producers off of their sites, so Spotify and others. Um, but you can still buy this clothing on Amazon, and you know you can buy it. You can buy Torch Diner on Amazon. You can buy um, any of these brands easily online, and they're not being monitored. So. You know, we have very strong free speech protections in this country, as we should, and, uh, but I think it's a role that civil society and watchdog groups can play um, uh, to, to try to keep um, uh, better tabs on it and put pressure on producers and on uh, the distributors to, to not sell hate. Um, because as I uh, make the argument in the book several times, they are a gateway, um, they're a gateway and they're a reflection um, to the scenes. While we take question and answer, I'll leave some of the thanks up there because I have promised, and as always, I have to say, the arguments that I present are not necessarily those of my funders. <laughs> but uh, I'm happy to take questions from anyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much.